Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being here. So today I'm going to present uh, my research that is about the evaluation of privately protected areas for the conservation of medium and large mammals in, and ground dwelling birds in a global biodiversity hotspot in Colombian Andes. Uh, so first, national parks are uh, one of the cornerstones of biodiversity conservation worldwide and they're like key tools in the efforts to save war um, biodiversity against the increasing uh, anthropogenic pressure. Um, however, uh, those national parks protect less than 10% of birds, for example, and mammals biodiversity. Uh, so they are insufficiently represented in those parks. Uh, some of those uh, national parks lacks of adequate management. And that's particularly true uh, for all for paper parks, which is like the protection activities can be like insufficient to halt degradation and to guarantee like active um, biodiversity conservation. So a uh, privately protected areas, uh, in this case, I'm going to say PPAs uh, for privately protected areas, borns as an alternative solution to uh, protect ecosystem and species outside national parks. So PPAs are increasing rapidly of the world and particularly in Latin America. Uh, those uh, PPAs potentially um, can uh, provide a quick response when any rapid environmental change can occur. Or also are able to uh, expand the protection where the government cannot take um, direct actions. And also, those PPAs are able uh, to protect ecosystems and species that are not well represented in some uh, areas. So, those privately protected areas conserve biodiversity, so we don't know for sure. And only a small number of studies of uh, effectiveness of PPAs uh, for biodiversity observations uh, can be found anywhere in the world. Few of those um, evaluations exist for Latin America and, and not any or not publishing even though for uh, Colombia that uh, we have more than 2,000 PPAs. So my research particularly uh, is to begin uh, to fill this knowledge gap for Colombia. So um, PPAs in Colombia are called also civil society reserve or in Spanish reservas eh, de la sociedad civil. They are legally recognized since 1996. And um, Colombia eh, has uh, around uh, 59 national parks and we other type of protection. Uh, it is 11% uh, of the territory protected and 700 are legally declared PPAs. Uh, but and those PPAs uh, in Colombia can include also management and use of, of the areas. They are voluntary, so individuals, communities, NGOs, organizations are able to uh, form a PPA or create a PPA. And they can include some economical benefits and research or education or touristic activities in there. Uh, so in Colombia, NGOs help to manage uh, networks and get the resources to develop conservation and sustainable projects and PPAs. And there are numerous of PPA or uh, organizations that are working with uh, PPAs network, but uh, most of those PPAs are small. So only like 29 of those uh, more than 2,000 um, PPAs are greater than 500 hectares and uh, some of them are isolated landscape and some are located in those agricultural landscape. As we can see here in this image, the um, uh, pink polygons are PPAs and compared to the green polygons that are the national parks, they are tiny in terms of size. So uh, where I developed this research, it was in the Serrani de los Paraguas. Uh, it's located in Colombia, in southwestern Colombia, particularly in the Andes. So we have three main mountain range and we developed this research in the western uh, part of Colombia uh, and that is called Serranía de los Paraguas. Uh, <coughs> Serranía de los Paraguas encompasses approximately 150,000 hectares from which more part is located in the Chocó forest and uh, the other part is located in 
Andes. So I did, or I particularly developed this research in the Andean portion uh, of this Serranía de los Paraguas. And we can see here in this image how the landscape looks like. It's just a mixture of um, forest with uh, some pasture and some crops and we can see the steepness of the of the site sites so my study region particularly uh, supports 60 ppas in a landscape of forest crops that is mainly uh, formed by chagrin coffee and fruiting trees and some cattle pasture and we have um, in this particular area like four small towns that uh, range between 700 and 3000 in terms of people and we have one major payroll and we have some um, small secondary unpaved ro roads. Um, so probably protected areas and conservation in my study site, and this is particularly true for most part of Colombia. So they are voluntary commitments, I, uh, as I mentioned before, and they combine conservation and production. And we can see here in this image that this is a PPA, like a legally like declared PPA, and most of this area is not forest. So just even like 20% or less of this area is forest. The other part of this area can be like pasture and we have some part in like in the south part of this area, they have sugar cane. So they are a combination of multiple uses. Uh, those areas are organized like in networks that basically they are connected geographically and the management is supported by local environmental NGOs. In this case, in this area, uh, there like two uh, local environmental NGOs, Serraniagua and Corpo Versalles, that were, uh, were the NGOs that are managing uh, those research. Um, some, those, some of the NGOs, I'm talking about Colombia, a uh, lack of scientific knowledge. Some of them also, uh, are supported by regional environmental agencies, but um, that is uh, not most of scientific knowledge for those um, local NGOs. The government support uh, for those PPAs is probable, but uh, for example, for tax reduction and exemptions is not obligatory. So that's the attempt to combine the production with conservation, compromise the value of PPA for, for conservation, really. So my work in here, I'm going to present like two main uh, findings for the first and my second chapter of my dissertation. So for my first chapter, I'm going to talk about if PPAs serve medium and large mammals. And for my second chapter, I'm going to talk about the Chagrin coffee, which is the mainland use type in this area, provide good habitat for ground birds and for mammals. Uh, and the idea is to use this information to guide local environmental NGOs in prioritization uh, of future plans for the network, also to increase the knowledge about the biodiversity um, uh, of local landowners and to improve design and management uh, of PPAs. So uh, for my first chapter, that is, do PPAs conserve medium and large mammals? So why mammals? So studies have shown that habitat um, loss affects every group of vertebrates in the world, but however, the effects of habitat loss appear to be stronger for those species that require um, huge or extensive habitats, such as most medium and large as mammals. Also, those medium and large mammals uh, perform important ecological functions as a pollination, seed dispersal, control of animal and plant populations. And also, this group is essential for the maintenance of the diversity and stability of various envi environments. And in Colombia, particularly, this is an understudy group. And even though we have the four highest um, mammal biodiversity in the world. So, the um, research questions for this uh, first part is the diversity of mammals in the Serranía de los Paraguas represented within those PPAs and if do PPAs support higher diversity of species by um, comparing to non-protected uh, land holdings with similar proportion of forests and also we were inter I was interested to understand what attributes um, of PPAs and the surrounding landscape explain the use by different groups of mammals and what factors need to be considered in terms of the expansion of protected area network. So my sampling uh, design, I sampled from July 2016 to July 2018. 
a sample of 53 areas, 29 PPAs and 24 non-protected sites. And we proportionally deploy camera traps, which is the main um, tool that we use for this, from four to 25 uh, cameras. So what is the scale of this? We can see this in, in this image, how this works. So we uh, put cameras, six, uh, a total of 619 cameras in 53 sites or areas and we also take some measurements at the landscape level because we were interested to see what is happening surrounding those uh, PPAs and what is happening in the landscape. So we uh, install cameras for a period of 30 to 60 days and we finally obtained, were able to obtain more than 25,000 uh, trap nights and 8,000 image uh, of uh, medium and large mammals. So this uh, picture is just to show about the field sampling that we performed in the Serranía de los Paraguas and landscape. We took a uh, measurement of canopy and understory density, and we were able to, to get this information from each camera site. So the data analysis or the analysis that we use um, to um, be able to answer our main question, uh, we do use a hierarchical multi-species occupancy model using a Bayesian framework. Um, it's a complicated word, so it was a complicated me, um, model too, but that the property of these models is that they use collective information for all observed species to inform uh, detection and occupancy. And that's particularly important because in, in this landscape and for mammals, uh, we were able to get uh, a lot of pictures, but for some species we just got few records. But those kind of models are able to handle those uh, few records and be able to predict occupancy or use of those species in the landscape. So we can incorporate also the sampling effects uh, in, that influence the occurrence. So how we handle the cameras, how we put the cameras, how close were to other, it was able to, to be incorporated in this, uh, in this model. So the covariates or the variables that we use for this analysis, so we have like three scales, as I mentioned before. So we have some camera level um, information, so like canopy, number of days, understory density. And I'm going to explain later a, bit of, a little bit about those variables like human disturbance, domestic dog occupancy that we have, um, that we know that some, in some areas domestic dogs are having an effect on those species. We have uh, one of the many important variables which is distance to continuous forest. I'm going to talk about this later. Uh, PPA, non-PPA is the composition. So how the how is the proportion of forest comparing to pasture and crops? And at the landscape scale, we'll be able to obtain some um, connectivity measurements too, to be able to obtain um, a occupancy. So the human disturbance, we were able thanks to um we were able to obtain a cost distance measure thanks to car didier because we think this variable it uh, was really important in our uh, study because it's not just using for example distance to towns which is one of the main variables that some research uh, published that is important for mammals but also we were able to put just in one variable the distance to roads distance to towns the access of the of the different like base of uh, how much you have to cross like um, crops or a pasture or a forest. So we were able to incorporate all this information in one variable that we call in this case anthropogenic disturbance. As we can see in here this map, we have some like red areas, which is like the areas that are close to the main road, the paved road, and this is going to have like higher disturbance than the other areas that are. Uh, um, far from this um, main line. And distance to continuous forest, as you remember that I show in the map, uh, the co forest is connected from this uh, upper part or the, um, the upper part of the mountains. So this is a continuous forest that goes from the upland to the lowlands. And we think this is one of the main important variables for, for this uh, landscape. So particularly we use that, we produce that map of uh, forest crops and pasture along this type in order to, to obtain our variables. In terms of site covariates, we use area size and site composition. So how, how proportion of each of the three mainland use type is in each area. And we were able to obtain, uh, based on, on buffer sizes, a, a fragmentation component. So we try to, to, uh, try to understand that 
the fragmentation component in this by using uh, a PCA for these variables. So we evaluate the response of three functional groups uh, in this um, uh, in this first part because we think if we talk about groups, we were able to produce maybe some strong conclusions about what is happening in big groups, what is happening in some groups that uh, can be more affected than just individual species. So we use bo body size like large, medium, and small, trophic bill, <coughs> omnivores, insectivores, carnivores, herbivores, and we also use some um, habitat specificity classification. So species that are more restricted to forest versus species that are more generalist. So the results for this uh, first part, so regarding the, is the diversity of mammals in the Serranía de los Paraguas represented in those uh, PPAs? So yes, we found 29 species out of the 33 potential species. And this is really good to find this number because even those other for like four species that, me, that we miss are more like lowland species. So we think that we capture almost all the diversity that we can find in this landscape. We um, found some like large body species, like nine species, medium body size species. And also something that was um, interesting in this um, study is that we also include small mammals because we were able to capture those species in the cameras. And we don't know a lot about those species, so we were able to include them in this analysis. They were pretty common. So for large mammals, one of, one of the examples that we found, we found like uh, nine species of large mammals. Uh, they are, one of them was the Andean bear, which is a vulnerable species. Uh, and one other species like the era deficient species like the mountain paca, like the red rocket deer. And also we were able to find a really interesting record of a jaguars. So uh, the jaguars, uh, they, can, they are more distributed like in the lowlands. So the, in the Pacific lowlands, inter-Andean valleys, and the Western and, and the Amazon. But I think uh, this is supporting that uh, those species, particularly the jaguar, is uh, using this habitat even if it is in high altitude. But we think this is this is a really important finding for this research. Regarding the medium species, we found like 13 species, two of them listed by the IUCN. Um, uh, we have like species like the snake tail armadillo, and we have like the oncilla and the margai, particularly the oncilla, which is a vulnerable, vulnerable species, was particularly common in all the landscape. And something uh, really interesting for this research was that the all we found all the species of wildcats reported for Colombia. So we think this is pretty amazing and we think that this landscape is really important because it's providing a uh, support that they can hold or support a lot of species and, and uh, medium and large mammals. For small species, we were able also to capture species like the mountain quarry, the Olinguito and the Colombian weasel, which is one of the species that are really uh, understood in Colombia of where they are, uh, what is the behavior of those species. So we were able also to capture those species. So regarding our second question, if do PPA support high diversity and level of use by mammals, the non-protected sites, so we found that PPAs are the same in terms of species occupancy for non-protected sites. So using detectability or even for during codes, we found no difference between PPAs and non-PPAs eh, sites that we evaluate. Uh, so that was the, the answer for this first question. So for the, and that is some, some picture of the cold species that we found in this landscape. So regarding the what factors are associated with mammals use in this landscape. So we found two main factors. Remember that uh, at the beginning I was talking about like six factors, but now we found that just two factors, which is like distance to continuous forest and human disturbance the driver, that are driving species occupancy in this landscape. So for large mammals and even for small species, we found that if you are closest to this continuous forest, we are having higher occupancy for those species. And uh, for human disturbance also was really important. For large species, they are trying to avoid those areas that are highly affected by uh, human disturbance. Uh, 
And for in terms of habitat specificity, so those forest restricted species, for example, uh, they are highly sensitive to this continuous to the distance to continuous forest. So they tend to be uh, for to be closer to area even if we have different fragments that are far from this uh, connect continuous forest they prefer to <coughs> sorry to do those, those areas that <coughs> sorry are close to the continuous forest and regarding the human disturbance those forest restricted species are are driving all the the occupancy of those forest restricted species so the main conclusion for this part is that PPRs are not different from non-protected sites in diversity so in terms of freeness and occupancy of mammals, uh, of mammals but we kind of expect this uh, response because we know that uh, land use and management are similar in those areas so the protection status is not actually like driving this response so but we've and two important things and two main points are for this that distance from continuous forest and the level of human disturbance is important so the landscape matters a lot and more than the reserve characteristics per se so we have to to take into account the, the big picture of this and uh, relating this to what we have in terms of ppas and uh, this landscape so particularly in here, we can see the largest PPAs is 700 hectares. It's just one of the, it's the largest PPAs in this network. Uh, but if we see, a, and we see the home range of most of these medium to large mammals, it just, we are protecting just a few number of home ranges of this species. So for example, if we try to extrapolate an example from US, so bull cats, for example, for bobcats, the home range is like three times the largest PPH in here. So we have to think about the landscape as a whole and not just individual PPAs because the home range of those species is huge. So in terms of the implication for design and management, so the need of creation of new reserve uh, to these existing PPAs is necessary to increase the effective size of the reserves. And key landscape features, uh, fish uh, to be considered in the designation of new PPAs. So, for example, the distance to continue forest and where those areas are located is important. And we have to target the, those sites. And one of the main conclusions is that we need to protect that continuous forest. So far, today, we have this forest. We have this forest that is not any under any protection status. So if that forest is driving species occupancy, if we don't have those, those, this forest, this continuous forest, we, are, we won't have a species. Now, uh, for the second chapter that we were more interested in this, because this is an agricultural landscape, as Shagro and Coffee, it's the most important uh, crops for this site. We were asking if this Shagro and Coffee provide good habitat. In this case, we're using one more group. So we are not just using mammals, we are also using ground birds. So we know that while agriculture is the leading cause of deforestation and forest degradation in the tropics, and around 70% of this Calandian forest has been replaced by agriculture. And while many species can persist, some portion of tropical biodiversity is always restricted to understood habitats. Nevertheless, agroforestry and low intensity agricultural a land a, can retain some forest-like characteristics and some species are able to use those areas. For example, Chevron coffee particularly is the most important a, product in tropical mountain environment and particularly the Serenia de los Paraguas is being um, declared by UNESCO as the, an, a coffee cultural landscape which means an exceptional example of sustainable and productive cultural landscape that is unique and representative of a tradition that is a strong symbol of coffee growing areas worldwide. So this site is particularly important. It's important because it's been like a reference site. So we need to think about what is um, apporting this Chevron coffee for, for the biodiversity conservation. Most of the studies uh, focus on canopy birds, and bats, small mammals, and insects in Chevron coffee, and few of them on medium and large mammals, and none on ground birds. So mammals and ground birds particularly for on the ground, which make them highly vulnerable to forest um, loss and degradation. 
uh, sorry, and ground building birds, for example, they are rare. They are habitat specialists, and most of them are unable to use or disperse across this matrix. So to understand the conservation value or the potential value of those land use types, it's necessary to both understand the richness and what the species are using those uh, sites and understand the landscape context in which this uh, coffee or agricultural landscape is. So my research question for the second part is if, if do mammals and ground birds with the Chevron coffee compared to forest fragments in the continuous forest. So how this change occurred from continuous forest to coffee and continuous forest to fragments and what determines the diversity in Chevron coffee and if local conditions are more important or how these local conditions are compared to landscape context and how will community composition structure change. So we use um, the same approach as the first chapter. We are using just a subset of this database. In this case, we use just 319 farmers. And as you can see here in this map, the dots are the forest, uh, the cameras in continuous forests, and the triangles are the uh, cameras in secondary forests and the coffee plantations. We uh, also use a multi species occupancy framework to analyze this information. So we use also the covariates as canopy, the number of these cameras were active, the understory density, human disturbance, distance to continue forest, and the land use category. As some of you may know, when you talk about Chevron coffee, most of the time you talk about canopy cover and understory density to potential drivers of, of species use. So we also use those variables to try to predict occupancy in those areas. So what uh, were the main results for this second part? So we did a large size mammals. We found the same 29 species. So even though we reduced the number of cameras um, we are using for this analysis, we got almost all the species that we were expecting. Uh, eight species that were forest restricted, eight that moved edge species, and 13 more like habitat generalists. This case of ground ruling birds, that is a new group that I'm introducing, or my new characters in here, is that we found 34 species. This is amazing because most of the time when we work with camera traps, people is not caring a lot about the ground birds, and we found an incredible diversity of these species. We have like around 25,000 records, so we have to analyze this data and I thanks to all the people that helped to classify those species like Harrison Johnson, like Luis Felipe, that they helped me to classify those species because we have a lot of data from this. Um, we found that 14 species are for restricted species, 12 species that are more like forest edge species and 5 species that are like generalists. And just an idea about the, the people that knows uh, uh, more about birds, we have like 7 species of ant which is related to the ant birds. This family is the most tied to the to the ground and we don't know a lot of information from them. It's like it's, it's really few information published about those species. So it was really interesting to see what is going on with those species. We found like three species of cinnamon, six species of thrushes, doves, doves, and we uh, were able to obtain uh, records for the chestnut wood quail, which is the near threatened species that we found in this landscape that is just endemic to the Colombian Andes. So this is some pictures that we have for for the birds. So regarding our first question, if do mammals and ground birds vary with land use? So we find in terms of richness that we have like two patterns, one pattern for the birds and one pattern for the mammals. And we can see that uh, even if this is richness just per camera base, uh, the, coffee the coffee and the fragment of birds is more similar than the richness that you can find in the forest. Going to the mammals, we have kind of like a mix, like more mixed response, um, but we can find that fragments and continuous forest supports a similar uh, number in terms of just species uh, richness compared to the coffee plantations. The same here, in this case, it's about mammals, so don't be scared about this graph, it's just like uh, we're trying to see how this occupancy changed in response to the continuous forest. So how the coffee changed in terms of 
from the continuous forest to the uh, coffee plantation. And we can see here, so from the left side of this graphic is just a, like a negative response and from the right side is a positive response. If we overlap this um, medium, like blue line is like a strong and significant response. But we can see here just like, a, we just have few significant response, the, but that we can see that most of the species are like affected negatively or the occupancy is, is negatively affected by this uh, change between continuous forest and coffee. And for the right side of this um, graphic is the change among the continuous forest to the fragments. And we have a mixed response, but mainly it's also negative response for some species, some positive. So some species are beneficiated for this and, and occupy those species and um, those uh, sites more than the uh, continuous forest. And that's particularly the same pattern for birds. We have like more negative response comparing to a continuous forest to a coffee uh, stations. But for continuous forest to fragment, we also have some mixture response between like negative to positive response for birds. So what determines the diversity in Chevron coffee? In this case, for this uh, question, we used a subset of the subset that we already used because we just used the cameras that we put in coffee plantations. And we, from the 29 species of mammals and 34 species of birds, a register in, in our landscape, just we found nine species of birds and 10 species of mammals. So from, and from species mainly for both groups they are like forest edge plantation scraps generalist species for the case of um, birds they are more like forest visitor, visitors and generalist omnivores and for mammals eh, all of them were medium and small mammals and most of them generalist and medium restricted except in the oncilla which is um, really interesting for this landscape but even it's a vulnerable species they were it was everywhere in the landscape. So in terms of what determined the diversity in this Chevron coffee, so we uh, didn't find like a strong response for other variables excepting for the human disturbance. But in this case, we have to be really careful about why is the response and how is the response with the human disturbance. So as we can see here, the species found in coffee, in coffee often respond positively to human disturbance. So because we are having a subset of species, so we have to remember that just like 10 of these species of mammals out of the 29, for those 10 species, most of them are like generalist species. So in the left part that we are having the mammals, we, we can see that the Antida, for example, is having a negative response, but for example, the armadillos are having a positive response to this uh, shagun coffee. In the case of birds, is also we don't have like strong patterns. But uh, for example, particular for this um, guano, uh, they have like a, a negative response. And in terms of species reason, we also find that human disturbance is um, having like a, a, a pattern here, but in this case, is a uh, positive response. So what, if we just see these graphics for uh, mammals in the left side and birds in the right side, we will say that human disturbance is good. But in terms of what we are thinking about is like this is a, a coffee plantation scape. So they are generally species that are taking advantage of the different land use types in these sites. So it, it, it's important to remember this when we are talking about like it's high, most of the species, but what kind of the species and what species are taking advantage of. So, so far today, um, more to come for this chapter, but the conclusion so far is that shagrun coffee is to support much less diversity of ground birds and mammals comparing to the continuous forest reference sites. And shagrun coffee support the generalist species but, and support just almost one third of the total number of potential species. We've had a strong predictor is the um, uh, disturbance, but it's just supporting one third of the total number of species. And many species respond positively just to that variable, the human disturbance in this region, and what's the only predictor. So what is the significance of, of this work? And in general, we find that 
this work particularly will help to prioritize sites for reserve to maximize their conservation impact for ground birds and medium and large mammals. And for the long term, we think that these three main key points is like the increase of the size of PPAs is one of the most important things, but also to make this a uh, PPAs contiguous because we know that because this is voluntary protection, uh, it's just like individual land owners that want to protect. But we have to target in terms of like NGO, for example, that are working with people uh, to try to make contiguous reserves so we can increase the uh, area or the total area protected and increase the protection of the continuous forest. And that was like one of the main important points of this research. We have right now a huge diversity. We found almost all the species that potentially can have this landscape. But if we don't protect this continuous forest, which is like the main um, driving variable for the species occupancy, we're going to lose those species in the near future. And one thing that also we want to, to spend some time in this presentation is that we realize we have a lot of information. We also did some interviews and we realized that biodiversity conservation in PPAs depends on people. If they know, we realize that if they know what they have in their lands, they care and they get involved and area may increase. So we realized that people were really engaged when we uh, so when we uh, present the, the pictures of the species that they have in the territory, and I think that why they feel that they are really protecting something, that they are not just like having a portion of forest that they say is working for the protection of species, but also they are having species there and what kind of species they are having there. So they really feel engaged after seeing the amazing number of species that they can have in this forest that they just, See, sometimes, they just, for example, for some species, we're really new that they have like pumas going on there or, or different kind of species. So I think that's, that's one of the main important points that I want to be sure in here that it was uh, really amazing to work with people and to let them know what, what they have in their lands. And I think that one of the, we, on one of the products of this research was um, uh, like a photo book of the species. So they were able to recognize and understand what species they have. Because we think that if they know what species they have, they know what they have to protect. So we were able to produce uh, like a, a photo album in which they were able to recognize the species, we were able to produce like two banners, one if they have the species and one about the, the role of the different species. Um, and the, also in, in this uh, landscape, we were able to do more than just like putting cameras and get the, the picture for, for this research, but we will uh, able to do some camera trapping workshops due to the NGOs that are working in this particular site. They were able to buy some cameras. So the idea is like they try to monitor those areas. So in the time also to, to recognize what is happening in the time. So those camera trapping workshops allow them to see how to put cameras, what is the best places to do it. Also, we did some wildlife conflict management meetings during the time that we were there. We were able to recognize that there is some conflict there. For example, some pumas predating on dogs. I think that's important that people recognize that they were there before we even arrived and to put our farms in there. So that, that's the idea to understand what is the role of pumas in the environment was really important for, uh, for them to of this information. We did a picture exhibition for schools and I think for, for children were really interesting to see what the species they have just like in minutes from their home. We do some local radio interviews and with this project in the early stage of this project we were thinking to also use some information that we collect from interviews. I was able to interview all the landowners um, and to see what kind of management they are doing, what they are doing additionally in their area, and also what species they recognize. So far, I have not analyzed this data, but they recognize they are not recognizing that much species that they have because also ownership is different and it's also changing through time. So I think that's important also to recognize that uh, there is new people there, there is some people that has been living there for more than 10, 15 years, 20 years, 50 years. So, 
So it's interesting that it's a different kind of people that now is managing those PPAs. So we have to take into account this because they are different approach also to approach people. Um, so uh, one of them, first I want to thank everybody or all the people that um, provide something and little things for this research. First, for my advisor, Dr. Lynn Branch, because she was vital in all this process since the beginning, the idea, and to uh, do the field work to improve this um, since the proposal to now. So I I'm, I'm really uh, want to thank uh, Dr. Lynn Branch for this. Also, uh, Dr. Oscar Murillo from Universidad del Valle. Uh, he was also main part in this process since the beginning of the research. And I think I was very lucky to be able to work with people from Universidad del Valle. Some of them were my field assistants, so I really appreciate uh, his help. My committee, Dr. Betty Lucel, Scott Robinson, Cardiger, and in early stage, Catherine Tucker, because I was um, taking to do more like a social part of this, but I hope to, to to do something before I graduate. And Harrison Jones and Kristen for the analysis, data analysis for the second chapter and all this help in the uh, birds uh, classification. I really appreciate their help. My field assistant uh, that were vital in this process. This is a, this was um, a really hard field work. It was two years of working and putting cameras and walking. And I think all those field assistants were vital in this role. The local field assistants also were important, Seraniagua and Geo and Corpo Versalles, all the people that work there that make my life pretty much easy to work uh, in this place. Um, the local field assistant and the reserve owners, at the end, they were also my field assistants because they really want to go with me and put cameras and they really want to go to their area, to their forest and, and look at um, the species. And Naturaleza Creativa, which was the, the organization that produced all those banners and figures and amazing figures of the species. And my current and past lab mates, they helped me a lot since the beginning of this process, family, friends, um, for all the support uh, of this time. And of course, the acknowledgement is also for the different organizations, University of Florida that provide a lot of funding from this. I think the fund, we were really lucky to get some important funding. And I think this research was thanks to all this support. We were able to travel a lot to cover a, a lot of areas and to buy cameras and to put cameras everywhere. And I think it was uh, for the help of, of all these organizations uh, from the UF, also from uh, different parts. So thank you to, to those organizations that make possible this work. And thank you all of you for being here. And um, yes, I'm open to, to questions now. <laughs>